Hello wrestling fans I am the Pro Wrestle Machine, and this is July 22, 1996 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Wrestlers dominate the UFC AAA makes return to the United States, latest in the Monday Night Wars, tons more by Observer staff Wrestling Observer Newsletter P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009-1228 July 22, 1996 the latest chapter in the evolution of the Ultimate Fighting Championship appears to be the dominance of the world-class heavyweight wrestlers. After Dan Severn captured both the Ultimate Ultimate and followed it up in the controversial Super Fight Championship match in May, a new wrestler, 31-year-old Mark Coleman of Columbus, Ohio, right out of U.S. Olympic team tryouts, was brought in basically to be the real test to find out just how tough Don Fry really is and also to play out some behind-the-scenes revenge of sorts. Fry proved to be tough once again, but a lot more mortal than in his previous appearances. When matched up with Coleman in the UFC 10 championship match, he fell victim to what many felt would be his Achilles heel so to speak, a bigger more skilled and more powerful wrestler with a good enough takedown to neutralize his boxing skill. Coleman, with an announced 31-pound weight advantage which looked that if not more, and a higher level of wrestling skill, was able to take Fry down at will and give him a brutal pounding for most of the 11.36 before referee John McCarthy stopped the match, thereby earning first-timer Coleman the $50,000 first prize check. Coleman, a former wrestler at Miami of Ohio, where he was a classmate of Brian Pillman, and Ohio State with two Pan Am Games gold medals and the 220-pounder on the 1992 U.S. Olympic freestyle team, trained for one month at the camp of Richard Hamilton, a professor of the martial arts from Grand Canyon University, whose camp has trained in the past both Severn for Ultimate Ultimate and Fry for his tournament win in Puerto Rico. This gives Hamilton's camp three tournament winners in a row along with the most recent Superfight winner. Coleman was Hamilton's basic second choice as his camp's entrant to spoil Fry's party, as the two had a falling out before the Detroit pay-per-view as Hamilton reportedly didn't like Fry's training attitude. Hamilton had recruited Tom Erickson, the second-ranked super heavyweight in the U.S. behind Bruce Baumgartner, to go into UFC provided he didn't make the Olympic team. Erickson, as expected, lost to Baumgartner, but was injured in the process and Hamilton instead brought Coleman, who placed sixth in the trials at 220 pounds, losing to Danny Chade, a former college teammate of Steve Williams, the eventual second-place finisher. Fry wound up not only losing, but being rushed to the hospital largely due to exhaustion along with a fractured orbital bone near the eye socket. He was released later that evening. The one-sided pounding Fry, who had been basically untouched to that point in going 6-0 and zero in UFC competition and was thought of by many as the new golden boy of the UFC in the wake of Ken Shamrock's loss to Severn, was a tribute to just how ferocious Coleman really was and just how much UFC is becoming more and more tailor-made for a world-class heavyweight wrestler who has enough training to avoid the fluke punch or a submission. UFC 10 on July 12th at the Bill Harris Arena on the fairgrounds in Birmingham, Alabama largely was considered a major success. The location was officially moved just 10 days before the show from its original site in Providence. Despite some local negative publicity, there was no real movement to keep the show out of town, unlike the nearly last-minute court fights that nearly stopped the two previous shows in Bayamon, Puerto Rico and Detroit and caused this event to change locations. Even more encouraging was with tickets on sale for slightly more than one week, they were able to sell out to the tune of 4,300 fans, tickets were scaled much lower than in other cities, from $50 down to $10 because locals in Birmingham had told Semaphore Entertainment Group officials that nobody would pay $50 in that city although those ended up being the first tickets sold. Despite competition in town of both pro wrestling in a better arena and a major concert. It's a virtual lock UFC will return to Birmingham probably in 1997. It was a basic meat and potatoes UFC show. There wasn't much in the way of special features introducing people to what was basically a cast of unknown newcomers. Just the basic tale of the tape and quick interviews, most of which were anything but memorable. The announcing wasn't bad, but with Don Wilson out doing a movie and Ken Shamrock not at the show, it took some personality and a little insight out of the Bruce Beck slash Jeff Blatnick duo. Aside from the fights themselves, the most memorable part of the show was the return of David Lee Abbott, who did an off the wall interview that was bordering on embarrassing. Tank, who was shown on the pay per view with a tape of him doing a legitimate 600 pound bench press. Not competition style but that's one hell of a bench for anyone even with somewhat loose form, the previous day, followed it up by doing off-color commentary during the Brian Johnson Fry semi-final that crossed the border. Abbott appeared to make Blatnick, Beck and probably most of the viewers ill at ease with his remarks about Johnston's red, white and blue ring shorts, basically referring to them as cute underwear, and talked about his match with Dan Severn saying he spent 20 minutes being raped by Freddie Mercury 
who he kept referring to Severn as, in reference to their match at the ultimate ultimate. By the time his commentary was over and he'd left, Beck remarked that it was questionable if Abbott would ever be asked back on the airwaves. Nevertheless, Abbott, up to 285 pounds and pretty much pushed as returning for the September pay-per-view show, once again got the biggest reaction from the live crowd in Birmingham, which was described from all sources live as being surprisingly well-educated as to the personalities and styles. The show was the fights. The fights were mostly good, in particular the final two matches. However, the hype and interest leading into the show seemed the lowest of any UFC to date, which may tell the tale when buy rate stats are available. The matches were as competitive as expected and hoped for. For perhaps the first time in the history of UFC, the results were almost totally predictable with no real surprises. The only two negatives one could point to in a show that received an overwhelmingly positive response is that they should have aired the alternate matches, held before the pay-per-view went on the air, during the long break between the semifinals and finals instead of too many lengthy interviews and plugs, and the lineup begged for one submission specialist just so there would be something different than the basic tackle and pound fights. It also can't be emphasized enough that part of the changes in style of fighting are from the implementation of gloves on most of the fighters. Gloves weren't allowed, an exception was made for one boxer in the first UFC during the Gracie era, and then made optional, although the majority of competitors chose to go bare knuckle. This resulted in more wrestling and working to submissions after the takedown, rather than simply pounding a guy, because bare knuckle punches over the long haul are doing to do more damage to the knuckles of the guy throwing the punch unless he's able to land them on soft tissue and avoid the skull. By this point even the wrestlers like Severn and Coleman have gone to wearing gloves to protect their hands. The result is a more dangerous and a bloodier sport, although one that, if gloves become mandatory, will ironically face less political opposition, Semaphore Entertainment Group's toughest foe, because of the basic ignorance that permeates this subject. Although the hardcore martial arts fans would probably enjoy non-gloved matches, because of more of a reliance on technique and working for submissions and less on simply brute power to get the first takedown and pound from there, shows like this one are probably closer to what the general public that buys these shows would like. The argument against it is that they are trying to demonstrate through UFC what styles are most effective in a real fight situation, as opposed to things like pro boxing, pro wrestling or movie fights, none of which has anything to do with true free fighting. In a real fight people aren't wearing gloves, although on the other end of the argument, they also are wearing shoes and there are no rules preventing them from kicking with the shoes as there are in UFC. Coleman who came into the show at 245 pounds, in the first drug-tested competition, showed only one weakness, a lack of conditioning after matches reached the five-minute mark. However, his power and skill level were too high for any of his opponents to capitalize. Dr. Richard Istrico, the UFC's regular physician and a member of the Medical Committee of the New York State Athletic Commission, implemented the first drug testing, similar to New York and Nevada rules in drug testing boxing, which means most notably no steroid testing, perhaps for fear of what would be found out although there is discussion of including steroid testing in the future. Drugs tested for were PCP, marijuana, amphetamines, barbiturates, codeine, cocaine, and morphine. A. In a battle of pro wrestlers, Gaza Coleman Jr., 1-1, one one, an indie wrestler out of the Detroit area who is a protege of Dan Severn, beat Duzelberto, 0-1, oh a Floridian trained by the Malenkos who has worked of late for pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi in Japan. Coleman took Berto down and was able to control his near the fence, and the ref stopped the match at 5.56 when Coleman threw several hard unanswered punches. B. Sam Atkins, 2-1, beat Felix Lee Mitchell, 0-2, oh by a unanimous decision after the 12-minute time limit ran out. This was the only match on the show the fans live weren't into. 1. Fry, 5 0, oh, beat Mark Hall 3 and 2, in 10 23 when the ref stopped the match. Fry planted Hall almost immediately and Hall went to the guard. Fry continued to throw punches to Hall's ribs, as his main offensive weapon. Hall's ribs turned reddish as Fry continued to pound on the same spot. Fry kept telling Hall to tap because he didn't want to seriously hurt him, but Hall kept screaming never. Finally ref John McCarthy stopped the match. Fry seemed to expend a lot of energy in this lengthy match and it appeared to affect him the remainder of the show. Hall took a tremendous pounding. 2. Brian Johnston beat Scott Fiedler, real name Scott Warren, in a battle of newcomers when the ref stopped the match at 2.25. Johnston who is 6 foot 3, 2.22 with backgrounds in judo, wrestling, kickboxing and boxing, had the well-rounded credentials. He appeared to go into the match thinking judo, as he threw a nice judo throw for a takedown. When he went for a second, Fiedler, who has a kickboxing and wrestling background, managed to somewhat block it and got behind Johnston, 
but didn't have the submission experience to take advantage of his positioning. Johnson escaped and got on top and threw several punches to the back of Fiedler's head before the ref stopped the match. The first round bracketing was changed with this match and the Gary Goodridge vs. John Campatella match flip-flopped the day before the show apparently due to complaints from some of the participants. It was agreed to since Goodridge was expected to win his matches was Fry, and it would avoid a Fry-Goodridge match that had already taken place. 3. Coleman beat first-timer Modi Horenstein, a karate fighter with no ground experience. Horenstein was a late replacement for Kevin Jacob who broke his hand while training. Coleman took him down and threw several hurt clean punches before the ref stopped it at 2.43. 4. Gary Goodridge, 3-2, beat first-timer John Campatella in 129. Campatella was billed at 5 foot 9, 235, but was more like 5 foot 6 with a thick powerlifter type physique so you had two powerful men against each other. Campatella got on top first, but Goodridge turned him and threw four hard punches to the face and Campatella tapped out in 127. 5. Fry 6 and 0, beat Johnston 1 and 1, in the first semi-final, almost more notable for Tank Abbott on color. The two traded punches standing up and the younger Johnston actually looked better, and it appeared a lot had been taken out of Fry in the first match. Finally Fry got behind him and went for the ribs with punches and elbows. Fry got side control on the ground and threw an elbow to the head when Johnston, realizing his predicament, tapped out at 4.38. 6. Coleman 2-0 beat Goodridge, 3-3, three three, in a one-sided but heated match. Coleman immediately took Goodridge down and threw some headbutts. Goodridge made a great showing even though overmatched, as he used the cage to pull himself to his feet. Coleman was behind him as if he wanted to throw a suplex, but Goodridge kept his balance holding the fence. Coleman threw some devastating uppercuts and Goodridge was unable to land a strong elbow. Goodridge managed a momentary reversal but Coleman quickly got back in control and threw more solid uppercuts and was bleeding. Coleman took him down again and threw punch after punch before Goodridge turned his back to avoid the pounding. Coleman double grapevined his legs and was about to do serious damage when Goodridge tapped out at 7 minutes. 7. Coleman 3-0 beat Fry, 6-1, in 11:36 to capture the championship. The basic story here was that Coleman was simply too strong a wrestler for Fry to have any offense. Fry refused to tap and, similar to the situation where he faced a Marie Bittetti, took a terrible pounding because of it. Coleman took Fry down and threw lots of heavy punches and headbutts. Fry took blow after blow but kept enough sense about him to stop an opening and try an armbar, but couldn't get it. Fry finally escaped at 4.23, but was quickly taken down again and took more punishment. At this point McCarthy stopped the fight so the doctor could check Fry's many cuts and told Fry he'd better get something going or he was going to stop it. When they restarted, Fry went for a double leg, but Coleman's balance and power wound up on top. He got behind Fry and went for a choke, but Fry reversed the position. Finally Coleman began throwing punches, knees and headbutts before the fight was stopped. The World Wrestling Federation is planning its biggest pure house show of 1996 to take place on August 24th at Toronto's Exhibition Stadium 10 years to the day after it set what was at the time the all-time recorded attendance record for pro wrestling in the same building drawing 69,300 fans. The show, billed as WWF Express, X to signify it being 10 years after the Hulk Hogan-Paul Orndorff show, will be headlined by Shawn Michaels vs. Goldust in a ladder match for the WWF title. No other matches have been announced, but it is expected that Undertaker vs. Mankind in a casket match and Sid vs. Vader will be the other main matches. It's a sold show as part of the CNE Fair in Toronto, similar to the Hogan Orndorff match 10 years earlier, so it's expected to draw the largest crowd for pro wrestling in North America probably in several years. AAA made its return to the United States with house shows on July 12th at the Phoenix Celebrity Theater and July 13th at the Grand Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. Both shows did reasonably well considering the poor television penetration in each market, with the debut in Phoenix drawing $1,700 paying $18,600 and Los Angeles drawing $2,500 paying $48,000. The show in Phoenix was largely well received, as it nearly packed a 2,500-seat venue drawing the usual hot AAA audience which created a strong atmosphere, and AAA will probably be returning as part of the local fair in September. Los Angeles was by far the weakest show AAA has put on in that market, both from a poor undercard with little in the way of wrestling, largely replaced by freeform sloppy brawling. The shows were also marred by several no-shows, two of them headliners Pero Agueo and Cien Caras. Caras missed the show reportedly because his working papers had expired. Agueo got in a dispute with Conan, who ran the tour, 
about the ECW-slash-FNW-ish style of wrestling he's introduced to the Mexican audiences on his shows. In addition, Agueo would have missed Phoenix anyway because AAA had a television taping in his hometown of Zacatecas the same night which he headlined, and they were running a major angle with him at the show. There was an interview with Pierre Roth Jr. early in the show where he mentioned Agueo not being there, but I heard no mention of Caras not being there nor were refunds offered. The shows themselves were very similar to the Triple Mania in Chicago where the heels were put over in every match on the undercard, largely with screw job finishes, leading to the faces winning the main event lumberjack strap matches with Conan and Octagon beating Pierre Roth Jr. and Killer with lots of outside interference from the lumberjacks. The situation in Tijuana, where Conan remains in a promotional war with former teacher Rey Mysterio, Miguel Lopez, has gotten more interesting. Conan ran a show outdoors at the Bullfighting Arena on July 14, drawing approximately 6,500 fans, a figure that has to be impressive considering they seem to be running that city nearly every week. The previous show was nine days earlier which drew about 3,000, the next show is July 21st and Mysterio is running the market regularly as well. The show plunged right into a dichotomy of fans' interest creating a weird environment in the main event a double-chain match street fight with Rey Mysterio Jr. and Super Colo vs. Psychosis and Damian. There is no doubt that the more violent style has helped at the gate, because they are running the market far too often with the same wrestlers and continuing to draw well, despite frequent location changes. However, once again, there were a lot of people walking out during the main event. Some of that could have been because the show lasted in excess of five hours, but the crowd was dead for a lot of the final two matches. The repeated cane shots and outside interference didn't draw anywhere near the heat that the traditional heel mannerisms with local undercard wrestlers had earlier in the show. Although the violence and gimmick matches appear to be drawing, particularly against the traditionalist group which doesn't have nearly the star power that's down to about 450 to 600 per show using the top EMLL names, the crowd in many cases doesn't react to it as compared to traditional style. The main event featured basically none of the wrestling nor flying that these four have the ability to deliver, instead a myriad of table-breaking spots, outside interference and juice, and not even all that well executed. By the end of the match, a large percentage of the crowd was gone and many of those that stayed were unruly beyond belief, particularly considering the city has long had some of the best behaved but most heated crowds you'd find anywhere in the world. In the outdoor bullfighting arena with a dirt floor, fans were pelting the ring with dirt and pebbles, and throwing cup after cup of dirt to the point the police were called and they were chasing people down around the arena. The women valets, women from WCW, who worked the entire tour managing psychosis. There was a lot of talk that this would be the start of an angle that would end up with Ric Flair and Arnold Anderson coming to Tijuana, was nailed with one dirt bomb after another. Halloween, who did a lot of outside interference during the match, was clocked over the head by a fan with a chair and was knocked silly for about 20 minutes after the match. There were also two excellent angles in the main event. After Kolo was KO'd when Psychosis gave him an Arabian moonsault while having him buried under chairs, it was two wrestlers in the ring and four wrestlers, Halloween and the Pandilleros, and two LA's out of the ring all against Mysterio Jr. Heavy Metal, a heel who didn't work the card because he suspended, but was on the tour, did a run-in as Psychosis and Damien held Mysterio Jr. but instead of attacking Mysterio Jr., he attacked Psychosis and Damien, declaring that he started his career in Tijuana as Canelo Casas even though fans haven't always liked him, when he wrestled people like Latin Lover, Santo and Jerry Estrada in the past, he always did it on his own and not eight on one. Mysterio Jr. came back from the dead and he and Metal cleaned house. While Metal carried Mysterio Jr. around on his shoulders to celebrate, he suddenly suplexed his backwards and put the boots to him, making it nine on one. Then Killer, in his costume, came to the ring to make it ten on one, but as Mysterio Jr. was being held, Killer attacked all the heels and pulled off his mask revealing Conan. The odds ended up too much for Conan as well, and finally at 22.09, Mysterio Jr. was pinned after being put through more chairs and tables. The fans were chanting for Agueo, who was there, to make the save, but apparently he wants no part of the shenanigans, and it was Octagon who made the last save with more cane shots. Two and a half stars. Overall Tijuana was a decent show, with some good wrestling in the middle of the card, but too long and all the shows relied far too much on mic work and gimmicks for heat, and had little in the way of lucha libre, and had horrible underneath matches. In the other results, 1. In a Four Corners Trios match, Los X-Men wound up winning over Los Pendilleros, Los Renegados, Genghis Khan and El Eo del Enfermero and El Chacal, and Los Brujas in 2038. Terrible match because it was too unwieldy. Pandilleros are good workers but Brujas and Renegados looked awful. One star. Two. In a women's triangle match, 
La Sirenita came out the winner via DQ over Shitara and Natasha in 1034. Shitara was pinned by Sirenita. Don Juan, a Los Angeles indie wrestler who was Sirenita's valet, decked Sirenita and began pounding on her until Pierre Roth Jr. ran in, teasing as if he was going to make the save for the Mexican girl who was wrestling the foreigner, but instead he also beat up Shitara. Negative one and one quarter stars. Three. Thunderbird and Firebird and Flamarian beat Halloween and Don Juan and Sueño Chicano in 2330. Pretty bad although there were good spots in there. Thunderbird did a handspring up the turnbuckle and turned it into a Frankensteiner off the top rope on Halloween to win the first fall. Flamarian tried a plancha into a Frankensteiner on the floor a la Mysteria Jr. but really didn't hit right. Halloween pinned Thunderbird with a tilt a whirl into a Dr. Bomb for the second fall. Third fall turned into a dive fest, ending with Thunderbird doing a shooting star plancha, but actually not turning all the way and nearly cracking his head on the ground. Halloween ended up laying down for Thunderbird in the third fall. After the match they issued challenges back and forth between Halloween, Baja California light heavyweight champion, and Thunderbird for the belt and did an impromptu match which Thunderbird won and got a ton of heat. However, Halloween attacked him with the belt and took the belt with him saying it wasn't a signed title match. One star. 4. Leon Negro and Blue Demon Jr. and Teen Yeblas Jr. beat Juventud Guerrera and Jerry Estrada and Cibernetico in 1415 when the local wrestler, Negro, pinned Estrada, to a big pop. 3 stars. 5. Parka kept the Iowa's light heavyweight title beating Misterioso. Torontes played total hill ref in this one. Misterioso won the first fall with a splash off the top and a fast count. There was lots of outside interference from Leo Del and Fermero in the fall in front of Torontes. In the second fall, Parka got the pin with a twisting crossbody off the top at a slow count. In the third fall, the commission booted Torontes out and the entire crowd started chanting for Pepe Casas. Casas came in and threw Torontes out and got the third fall going, and it was a collection of dives and near falls, mainly by Parka, who did a plancha off the top to the floor, a leap off the chair into a springboard plancha, a topo misterioso was sitting in a chair, and he tried a plancha with Misterioso in a chair but Misterioso moved and he plancha the chair. At that point they did the Malenko Ray Jr. title change finish, with Misterioso throwing Parka into the ring rather than taking the title by a count out, and twice picking him up at two on near falls, before Parka finally scored the cradle for the pin. Three and one half stars. Six. Conan and Alguayo and Octagon beat Killer and Pieroth Jr. and Cien Caras in 1630 when Octagon pinned Caras. A decent match but nothing more. 1 and 3 quarter stars. ECW drew the largest crowd in its history once again for its July 13th show at the ECW Arena in South Philadelphia. While no real figures are or will be available, the crowd was said to be larger than for the show three weeks earlier which had set what at the time was the company's record. The last crowd was estimated at between 1,200 and 1,550 and at this show there was literally almost no walking space available in the tiny building because fans were so packed in. Getting real crowds for ECW Arena is basically impossible as based on pressure from outside sources. The State Athletic Commission won't release figures for ECW shows although when figures were available they were always significantly lower than estimates elsewhere. In some cases figures were so much lower that it was clear those figures couldn't have been accurate as few months ago for a packed house show, we received a figure from the commission that the paid crowd was in the 400s and it is pretty well known the ECW shows aren't significantly papered. Crowd estimates from various attendees at the July 13th show ranged from 1,300 to the figure of 1,700 claimed with most estimates in between. The show was said to have been among the best in company history when it came to crowd reactions as every storyline got a huge response and there were standing ovations at the end of several matches. The highlight match, said to be one of the better matches in company history, was a four corners match for the ECW TV title with Chris Jericho, Pitbull No. 2, Shane Douglas and 2 Cold Scorpio. It wound up with Douglas vs. Pitbull. As Pitbull had Douglas pinned, Francine turned on Pitbull then pulled off her skirt to reveal panties that had franchise written on them. Pitbull number 1 came out and it wound up with Francine being super bombed through a table. After that point Douglas and Pitbull traded near falls before Douglas won the title clean with a belly-to-belly -belly suplex in a match that lasted more than 30 minutes. The main event on the show was a bout with Sandman and Raven in a cage, Brian Lee and Tommy Dreamer brawling all over the place, and Terry Gordy and Stevie Richards battling over who could get in the cage first to make it a two-on-one. In a bloodbath, it wound up with Raven being handcuffed with his hands spread as if he were being crucified. 
to repeat the spot from last year that is in the show's openings where Dreamer destroys him with a chair. At this point, Dreamer had a chair in Sandman, who is noticeably bothered by his bad knee, which he seems to blow out doing minor things on a weekly basis because he isn't taking time off to rest it, at his cane but Sandman's son Tyler jumped in front of Raven, and spread his arms. Sandman stopped in his tracks, but Dreamer still wanted to swing the chair and Sandman and Dreamer argued over that spot. Later in the match was a spot where three tables were set up on top of each other outside the ring, Dreamer was sitting on the top of the cage and Lee was standing inside the cage on the top rope and basically shoved Dreamer off, it was supposed to be a choke slam but really didn't come off as one, and Dreamer for the second show in a row took the bump through three tables. The match ended with Sandman pinning Raven, which no doubt will lead to title matches down the line. Among the other show highlights was the return of 9 and the debuts of Tarzan Goto and Luis Piccoli. We don't have complete details as to the behind the scenes of the 9 deal, although apparently it was a twofold deal. After 9 had refused to do Paul Heyman's original plan several months ago to put Taz over as a giant killer, which ended with him leaving the promotion, and the Paul Verlin situation backfired, Heyman finally got the deal done. As Joel Gertner was doing a heel ring announcer bit, 911's music played and he came out and choke slammed Gertner. He then choke slammed Taz, who was in the ring with Bill Alfonso as part of the angle. As he went for Alfonso, Taz popped up from 911's trademark spot, suplexed him on his head, and choked him out. In post show interviews, Brian Lee did an interview basically saying that he was the king of the choke slams, so it's not clear whether 911 was brought in for the one shot and came in simply to keep the contract supplying the rings for ECW or if he's back and had to do this angle as a punishment to get his job back. Goto, from IWA in Japan, which ECW is running two shows in conjunction with on August 10th and August 11th in Yokohama and Tokyo respectively, beat Axel Rotten both on July 12th in Allentown and again at the arena, largely for Japanese photo ops. Goto is an ECW-style brawler, but really didn't get over that big in either city. Spicoli was said to have surprised everyone having a strong match with Sabu, although they were said to have went too long and Sabu appeared to have missed his planned finisher. The highlight of that match was Sabu moonsaulting off the top rope outside the ring and sending Spicoli through a table. Matthew Annis, the 13-year-old grandson of Stu and Helen Hart, passed away just after midnight on Sunday at Calgary Children's Hospital after an 11-day ordeal. Annis, the son of Stu and Helen's daughter Georgia and BJ Annis, a former Stampede wrestler, 1985-1986, and bodybuilder-slash-gym owner in the Calgary area, had fallen into unconsciousness on July 4 with a disease called streptococcus, which ate away at his internal organs and caused almost all his vital system to shut down as he went into toxic shock syndrome. He really wasn't expected to survive July 5, but fought the disease for more than one week and seemed to be making progress. He'd been on life support since that time, on kidney dialysis and a respirator with his heart being the only organ working, and most of the family had been almost constantly in the hospital hoping and praying. Bret Hart rushed back from an anniversary weekend with his wife Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith were given the weekends off by the WWF. All spent much time talking with him about things like current WWF angles and the ultimate warrior situation, and his blood pressure which was weak seemed to pick up when Bret and Owen talked wrestling with him and Bret talked about coming back to the ring. Bret went on the WWF's company fans cruise and Owen and Smith returned to work on July 11th, and while all were gone, they got the news. Annas appeared to have been improving on Saturday, and they wanted to take him off some of his life support systems so they could perform a series of needed operations, but after beginning the process, he relapsed on Sunday morning. Eventually his lung collapsed and his heart stopped and he died from cardiac arrest. Annas was a huge wrestling fan who idolized Brett. Owen and Davey and was already training to form a second-generation British Bulldogs tag team with his younger cousin Harry, the son of Davey and Diana. The two were scheduled to wrestle in tag team matches along with Matthew older brother Ted and a family friend for the third year in a row as part of the annual Stampede Wrestling Card at the Rockyford Rodeo near Calgary on July 20th and July 21st. The Smiths decided to move back to Calgary from Florida and put a wrestling ring in their backyard largely so the cousins would be able to spend more time learning wrestling. A private funeral was scheduled for this week at Stu's house in Calgary. Latest buy rate figures we've received are that WCW appears to have done in 0.48 buy rate, 120,000 buys, best. $1.34 million. For the June 16th Great American Bash, WWF appears to have done in 0.60, 150,000 buys, best. 
$2.02 million, for June 23 King of the Ring and preliminary estimates of the WCW buy rate for the Great American Bash with the Hall and Nash match with all the intrigue have ranged as high as 0.80 but most have pegged it at 0.71, 178,000 buys, $2.23 million. We have no UFC estimates at press time. One would have to label all three figures as somewhat disappointing in that WCW actually declined over the previous year despite its hot television angle. Even though overall interest in wrestling appears way up, and WCW's television ratings picked up greatly in June with the new angle and WWF's arena businesses up, although running so many fewer shows and more loaded shows makes comparisons misleading, the PPVs across the board continue a pretty noticeable decline. That is also somewhat misleading because there are so many more pay-per-view events this year than any previous year so they should flatten out. Results June 30th Sheerness, England, Hammerlock Wrestling, 250, Wildcat D. Tyrone Archer, Alex Shane DDQ Justin Richards, Andre Baker and Amanda Dallas B. Doug Williams and Tansy Cook DQ, Titan B. Shiro Nagumi, Shane and Ian Johnson B. Tony McMillan and Richards. July 4th Maywood, California, AIWA, Thrashmaster B. Ladies Man, Bloody Maniac and Galino B. Mace and Johnny Legend DQ, Dan Fabiano Kurt Clawlock, Tech 9 and Craze 1 B. Supreme and Kid Chaos, Payasitos de America B. Sammy Delgado and Cara Mercada, Jack Stud Kerr Ultraman Robin. July 5th Maywood, California, AIWA, Antonio Rocco B. Bloody Maniac, Bubba Storm and Alex Knight and Dan Fabiano B. Sammy Delgado and El Indio and Galino, Ultraman Robin B. Tech 9, Peter Maivia Jr. B. Jack Studd. July 7th, Providence, Rhode Island, WWF 3774, Duke Drossi B. Leaf Cassidy, Salvatore Sincere B. Barry Horowitz, Godwin's one triangular match over Body Donna's and Smoking Guns, Jake Roberts B. Justin Bradshaw, Undertaker B. Mankind Core, IC Title, Ahmed Johnson B. Goldust, Steve Austin B. Savio Vega, Mark Marrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, WWF Title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader. July 7th, San Bernardino, California, Indiana, 250, Gary Key B. Dick Danger Core, Ghetto Boys B. Third Dimension and Ultra Taro, Louis Spicoli B. Rage and Raven, Christopher Daniels B. Bulldog Sampson, Irish Assassin B. Lil Haystacks, Bobby Bradley Jr. and Suicide Kid B. Tim Patterson and Eddie Williams, Patterson won Battle Royal. July 8th, Memphis, USWA, 1000, King Cobra B. Reggie B. Fine, Tony Williams B. Brickhouse Brown, Hubcap Match, Wolfie D B Bill Dundee, Doug Gilbert and Brian Christopher B Frank Morell and Tony Falk, USWA Tag Titles vs Cabana's Hair, Flex Cabana and Bart Sawyer B Jerry Lawler and Dundee to win titles. Unified Title, Christopher B Jeff Jarrett DQ. July 8th, Koji, All Japan Women, Genki Misae B Yoshiko Tamura, Mario Yoshida B Saya Endo, Tashio Yamada and Mima Shimoda B Kyoko Inoue and Shaparita Asari, Etsuko Mita B Tomoko Watanabe, Manami Toyota and Reggie Bennett and Kaoru Ito B Asia Kong and Takako Inoue and Kumiko Maikawa. July 8th, Rochester, Minnesota, AWA, 650, Sam Houston B JB Trask, Johnny Stewart B Twin Turbo, Nails DDQ Charlie Norris. July 9th, Orlando Disney Studios, WCW Saturday Night Tapings, 600 Full House Slash Papered, Hugh Morris and Kevin Sullivan and Meng and Barbarian B. Prince Aao Kia and Butch Long and, and, Greg Valentine B. Bill Payne, Conan B. Top Gun, David Cannell, Ric Flair and Arnold Anderson and Chris Benoit B. Mark Starr and Cobra and Alex Wright, Dick Slater and Mike Enos B. Todd Morton and Joe Gomez, Harlem Heat B. Public Enemy. July 9th, Asahi Kawa, New Japan, 2350 sellout, Tatsuhito Takaiwa B. Utaka Yoshi, Shinjiro Otani B. Tokumitsu Ishizawa, Kunyaki Kobayashi and Kengo Kimura B. El Samurai and Norio Onaga, Osamu Nishimura B. Brad Armstrong, Akitoshi Saito and Mishiyoshi Ohara B. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan, Shiro Koshinaka and Tatsutoshi Goto and Akira Nagame B. Yuji Nagata and Satoshi Kojima and Junji Hirata, Hawk and Animal and Power Warrior B. Tadao Yasuda and Osamu Kido and Shinya Hashimoto Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka B. Keiji Muto and Jushin Liger. July 9th Miyagi, All Japan Women, Saya Endo B. Genki Misae, Tomoko Watanabe B. Kumiko Makawa, Kyoko Inoue and Takako Inoue B. Asia Kong and Tashio Yamada, Mima Shimoda B. Shaparita Asari, Yumiko Hara and Itsuko Mita and Reggie Bennett B. Manami Toyota and Mariko Yoshida and Kaoru Ito. July 9th Vienna, Austria CWA, 500, David Finley B. Ulf Herman, Brian Armstrong D. Tony St. Clair, 
Michael Kovacs B. Hercules Boyd, Greg Boyd, E.Q. Max Payne, Daryl Peterson, B. Rambo, August Smile, and Franz Schumann B. Drew McDonald and Danny Collins. July 10th Obihiro, New Japan, 2200 Sellout, Tadao Yasuda B. Yutaka Yoshi, Tatsuhito Takaiwa B. Tokamitsu Ishizawa, L. Samurai B. Shinjiro Otani, Brad Armstrong and Jushin Liger B. Kunyaki Kobayashi and Akitoshi Saito, Satoshi Kojima and Junji Hirata B. Akira Nagami and Tatsutoshi Goto, Hawk and Power and Animal Warrior B. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and Masa Chono, Keiji Muto and Osamu Kido and Osamu Nishimura B. Mishiyoshi Ohara and Kengo Kimura and Shiro Koshinaka. July 10th Greenville, South Carolina, Southern Championship Wrestling, 212, Mickey Free B. J.W. Steele, Swat B. Ricky Regal, Cruiser Lewis B. Freedom Fighter, Butcher Blackwell B. Johnny Dollar, J.J. Justice N.C. Nightmare, Jake Mulligan and Desperado B. Wahoo McDaniel and Ricky McDaniel. July 11th, Albany, New York, WWF, 4,579, Justin Bradshaw B. Bob Holly negative one star, Vadi Donna's 114 elimination match over Godwin's three stars, Smoking Guns and New Rockers, Steve Austin B. Savio Vega one and one quarter stars, Owen Hart B. Jake Roberts one star, Undertaker B. Mankind one and one quarter stars, IC Title, Goldust B. Ahmed Johnson DQ one and one quarter stars, Mark Merrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley three stars, Sid B. Davy Boy Smith negative four stars, WWF title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader two and a half stars. July 11th, Orlando Disney Studios, WCW Worldwide Tapings 450 Full House slash All Freebies, Scott Norton B. Todd Morton, Alex Wright B. Buddy Valentine, Billy Kidman B. Cicosis, Steve Regal and David Taylor B. Steve and Scott Armstrong, Chris Benoit B. Eddie Guerrero, Dick Slater and Mike Enos B. Mike Wenner and Mark Starr, Gambler B. Chad Brock, Leprechaun, Wayne Bruce aka Buddy Lee Parker, B. Joe Gomez, Craig Pittman B. Gambler, Norton B. Manny Fernandez, Not Original, Dean Malenko B. Kidman, Conan B. Kurosawa, Arnold Anderson, and Benoit B. Jim Powers and Gomez, Leprechaun B. Brock, Eddie Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero Jr. B. High Voltage, Kevin Sullivan B. Brock, Ice Train B. Max, Big Bubba B. Chip Minton, Eek B. Slater and Enos, Jim Duggan B. Buddy Valentine, John Tenda B. Cuban Assassin, Yaokia B. Fernandez. July 11th Hakata Star Lanes, All Japan, 2,500 Sellout, Satoru Asako B. Yoshinobu Kanamaru, Tsuyashi Kikuchi and Yoshinari Ogawa B. Manukiya Mossman and Rob Van Dam, Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto B. Haruka Aigen and Mighty Inoue, Johnny Smith and the Patriot B. Takao Mori and Masao Inoue, Ryukaku Izamida and Giant Kimala 2 B. Chris and Mark Youngblood, Steve Williams and Johnny Ace and Brian Diet B. Bobby Duncombe Jr. and Gary Albright and Stan Hansen, Kenna Kobashi D. Jun Akiyama 30 Minutes, Akira Tao and Toshiaki Kaoda and Masa Fuchibi Mitsuharu Masawa and Giant Baba and Tamon Honda 2238. July 11th Kushiro New Japan 2000 Shinjiro Otani B. Yutaka Yoshi, Mishiyoshi Ohara and Kengo Kimura B. Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Tao Yasuda, Hiro Saito B. Yuji Nagata, Jushin Liger and L. Samurai B. Brad Armstrong and Norio Onaga, Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka B. Tokamitsu Ishizawa and Osamu Kido, Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan B. Kunyaki Kobayashi and Akitoshi Saito, Hawk and Animal and Power Warrior B. Masa Saito and Keiji Muto and Satoshi Kojima, Akira Nagami and Tatsutoshi Goto and Shiro Koshinaka Bishinya Hashimoto and Osamu Nishimura and Junji Hirata. July 12th Worcester, Massachusetts, WWF, 4556, Justin Bradshaw v. Bob Holly Dudd, Body Donna's 114 elimination match over Godwins, Smoking Guns and New Rockers 3 stars, Steve Austin v. Savio Vega 3 and a quarter stars, Owen Hart v. Jake Roberts 1 half of 1 star, Undertaker v. Mankind 2 stars, IC title, Goldust B. Ahmed Johnson DQ 3 quarters of a star, Mark Merrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley 1 and 3 quarter stars, Sid B. Davy Boy Smith 1 star, WWF title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader 1 and 1 half star. July 12th, Doritz Kitami, New Japan, 1800, Akitoshi Saito B. Tokamitsu Ishizawa, Tatsuhito Takaiwa B. Norio Onaga, Akira Nagami B. L. Samurai, Osamu Kido B. Brad Armstrong, Shinjiro Otani and Tadao Yasuda B. Kunyaki Kobayashi and Kengo Kimura, Shiro Koshinaka, and Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara B. Satoshi Kojima and Jushin Liger and Keiji Muto, Hawk and Animal and Power Warrior B. Osamu Nishimura and Junji Hirata and Shinya Hashimoto, Yuji Nagata and Takashi Izuka and Kazuo Yamazaki B. Hiro Saito and Masa Chono, and Hiroyoshi Tenzan.
July 12th Asato, All Japan, 1400, Rob Van Dam B. Satoru Asako, Chris and Mark Youngblood B. Tsuyashi Kikuchi and Kentaro Shiga, The Patriot B. Monokia Mossman, Mighty Inoue and Haruka Aigen and Masa Fuchi B. Mitsuo Momoda and Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura. Giant Kimala 2 and Ryukaku Izumida B. Masao Inoue and Yoshinari Ogawa, Yuri Albright and Johnny Smith B. Tamon Honda and Takao Mori, Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Taubi Stan Hansen and Bobby Duncombe Jr., Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenta Kobashi and Jun Akiyama B. Steve Williams and Johnny Ace and Brian Diet. July 12th Allentown, Pennsylvania, ECW, 900, Taz B. Mikey Whipwreck, Luis B. Coley B. L. Puerto Ricano, Tarzan Goto B. Axel Rotten, ECW TV titled Chris Jericho D. Shane Douglas, Samoan Gangsta Tribe NC Big Dick Dudley and Bubba Ray Dudley, Bad Crew B. Havoc Incorporated. Sandman B. Blue Dust, Rick Heffron aka Blue Meanie, Sabu B. Hack Myers, 2 Cold Scorpio B. Pit Bull No. 2, ECW Tag Titles, Eliminators B. Gangsters, Terry Gordy and Tommy Dreamer B. Raven and Brian Lee. July 12, Phoenix, Arizona, AAA, 1700, Natasha won Triangle Match over Shitara and La Sirenita 1 in 3 quarter stars, Cybernetico and Damien and Halloween B. Blue Demon Jr. and Teen Yablis Jr. and Mascara Sagrada Jr. 2 and 3 quarter stars, Mexican welterweight title Psicosis B. Rey Mysterio Jr. 2 and 1 quarter stars, Juventud Guerrera and Jerry Estrada and Heavy Metal B. La Parca and Super Colo and Mascara Sagrada DQ 3 and a quarter stars, Lumberjack Strap Match, Conant and Octagon B. Pierre Roth Jr. and Killer 3 and 1 half stars. July 12, Sakatekas AAA Mascara de Sagrada Jr. and Super Muñequito B. Espectritos 1 and 2, Lumberjack Strap Match, Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Oro Jr. and El Mexicano NC Caras La Momia and Payaso Amarillo and Super Manieco Pero Agueo and Ultimo Dragon and Latin Lover B. Los Villanos DQ. July 12, Brighton, Tennessee. American Wrestling Alliance, Todd Johnson B. Ripley Prim, Blade Boudreau B. J.T. Storm, Ty Dalton B. Pete Madden, David Denton and Romeo Valentine B. Tim White and Boudreau, Big Ben B. Motley Cruz, Eric King B. Kaleidoscope Kid, Bill Rush, Terry Golden B. Danny B. Good. July 12th, Rossville, Georgia, TWA, Rick Justice B. Dragon Master No. 1, Scott James B. Dragon Master No. 2, Cyberteam 5000 B. Michael Collins and Outpatient, Keith and John and Ken Arden B. Woody Woodchuck and Randy Watkins and Pulpwood, Chuck Colt B. Joel Travis. July 13th, Philadelphia ECW Arena, ECW 1500 Sellout, Gangsters B. Samoan Gangsta Tribe, Mikey Whipwreck B. Paul Loria, ECW Tag Titles, Eliminators B. Sabu and Whipwreck, Dances with Dudley and Bubba Ray Dudley and Big Dick Dudley B. Big Guido, Primo Carnera 3, and Little Guido, James Stone, and J.T. Smith, Tarzan Goto B. Axel Rotten, Shane Douglas won four corners match for ECW TV title over two Cold Scorpio, Pit Bull No. 2 and Chris Jericho, Sabu B. Louis Spicoli, Cage Match Slash Brawl Everywhere, Sandman and Tommy Dreamer and Terry Gordy B. Raven and Stevie Richards and Brian Lee. July 13th Los Angeles Grand Olympic Auditorium AAA 2500, Natasha won triangular match over Shitara and La Sirenita three stars, Cybernetico and Damien 666 and Halloween B. Blue Demon Jr. and Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Teen Yablas Jr. three quarters of a star, Mexican welterweight title Psicosis B. Rey Mysterio Jr. to win title one and one quarter stars, Jerry Estrada and Heavy Metal and Juventud Guerrero B. La Parca and Super Colo and Mascara Sagrada two and one quarter stars, Lumberjack Strap Match, Conan and Octagon B. Pierre Roth Jr. and Killer one and three quarter stars. July 13th, Portland, Maine, WWF, 3,314, Justin Bradshaw B. Bob Holly, Body Donna's won four corners match over Smoking Guns, God Wins and New Rockers, Steve Austin B. Savio Vega, Owen Hart B. Jake Roberts, Undertaker B. Mankind, IC Title, Goldust B. Ahmed Johnson DQ, Mark Merrow B. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Sid B. Davy Boy Smith, WWF Title, Shawn Michaels B. Vader, July 13th Saga All Japan, 2100 sellout, Masao Inoue B. Yoshinobu Kanemaru, Manukiya Mossman and Tsuyashi Kikuchi B. Mark and Chris Youngblood, Tamon Honda B. Brian Diet, Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto B. Mighty Inoue and Haruka Aigen and Masa Fuchi, Rob Van Dam and the Patriot B. Ryukaku Izumida and Giant Kimala 2, Jun Akiyama and Takao Mori B. Gary Albright and Johnny Smith, Steve Williams and Johnny Ace B. Stan Hansen and Bobby Duncombe Jr., Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tao and Yoshinari Ogawa B. Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenakobashi and Satoru Asako. 
July 13, Orlando Disney WCW Attraction Matches, Public Enemy B. Prince Iaokia and The Gambler, Eddie Guerrero B. Billy Kidman, Chris Benoit B. Alex Wright, Big Bubba B. Joe Gomez, Rick and Scott Steiner B. Hugh Morris and Max, Ice Train B. Cobra. July 13, Ichihara, All Japan Women, Genki Misae B. Yumi Fukawa, Reggie Bennett B. Yoshiko Tamura, Kaoru Ito and Mariko Yoshida, and Minami Toyota B. Tashio Yamada and Atsuko Mita and Shaparita Asari. Asia Kong B. Mima Shimoda, Yumiko Hata and Takako Inoue B. Kyoko Inoue and Tomoko Watanabe. July 13, Macy, Nebraska, Pro Wrestling America, Mantor DDQ Randy Gusto, Nails B. Night Stalker, Charlie Norris and Sam Houston B. Nails and The Hater. July 13, Kissimmee, Florida, Southeastern Championship Wrestling 250, Al Hardiman B. Slick Willie, Blade Runner Ger Ox, Cliff Anderson B. Cowboy Butch, DJ Hunter B. Randy Starr, Kevin Sullivan and Dick Slater be American Samurai and Rockin' Hillbilly. July 13, Morristown, Tennessee, Tennessee Mountain Wrestling, Chris Steelhart be Rick Savage, Steve Skyfire be David Jericho, Chris Powers be Mr. Olympian, Tracy Smothers be Bunkhouse Buck, 8 Ball Jones and James Blevins, NC Mongolian Stomper and Dirty White Boy. July 13, Anniston, Alabama, Dixieland Championship Wrestling, 150, Ultimate Power Ranger B. David Lee DQ, Brad Cooley B. Mighty Yankee Larry Santo, Kevin Neal B. Randy Barber DQ, The Olympian David Young, B. Foreman, Lee Pete, The Bullet, Bob Armstrong, and Arachnaman B. Lee and War Machine DQ. July 13, Southern Pines, North Carolina, New Frontier Wrestling Alliance, 100 Dynamo Kid and Wolverine B. Grave Robber and Big Fist Brawler, TC Flexor B. Devastator, High Voltage B. Champagne, Carolina Warrior B. Simba, Punisher B. Colt Justice, Ethan Storm and C. Wachi. July 14th, Kaitamazawa, New Japan, 1800 Kunyaki Kobayashi and Akitoshi Saito B. Utaka Yoshi and Tatsuhiro Takaiwa, Osamu Kido B. Tadao Yasuda, El Samurai B. Norio Onaga, Brad Armstrong and Jushin Liger B. Tokumitsu Ishizawa and Shinjiro Otani, Akira Nagami and Shiro Koshinaka B. Yuji Nagata and Junji Hirata, Hawk and Animal and Power Warrior B. Mishiyoshi Ohara and Tatsutoshi Goto and Kengo Kimura, Takashi Izuka and Kazuo Yamazaki B. Osamu Nishimura and Shinya Hashimoto, Satoshi Kojima and Keiji Muto and Riki Chashu B. Hiro Saito and Hiroyoshi Tenzan, and Masa Saito. July 14, Sasebo, All Japan, 2500, Suyashi Kikuchi B. Mighty Inoue, Chris and Mark Youngblood B. Johnny Smith and Manukia Mossman, Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoto B. Haruka Aigen and Masa Fuchi, Masao Inoue and Ryukaku Izamaya and Takawa Mori B. Kentaro Shiga and Satoru Asako and Giant Baba, The Patriot and Johnny Ace B. Rob Van Dam and Gary Albright, Bobby Duncombe Jr. and Stan Hansen B. Brian Diet and Steve Williams, Kenna Kobashi B. Giant Kimala 2, Miwaru Misawa and Jun Akiyama and Tamon Honda B. Akira Tao and Toshiaki Kauda and Yoshinari Ogawa. July 14th Orlando Disney, WCW Attraction Matches, Steve Regal and David Taylor B. Chad Brock and Chavo Guerrero Jr., Diamond Dallas Page B. Disco Inferno Harlem Heat B. High Voltage, Eddie Guerrero B. Bobby Eaton, Mike Ennis and Dick Slater B. American Males, Scott Norton B. Bobby Walker. July 14, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, All Japan Women, 1850 Sellout, Takahashi D. Nakanishi, Genki Misae and Itsuko Mita B. Marco Yoshida and Yumi Fukawa, Takako Inoue B. Tomoko Watanabe, Mima Shimoda B. Kaoru Ito. Reggie Bennett B. Tashio Yamada, Takahashi B. Thundercrack, Shaparita Asari and Kyoko Inoue B. Yoshiko Tamura and Manami Toyota, Yumiko Hata B. Asia Kong. July 14, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, Martial Arts Festival, 1800 Sellout, Satoshi Yoniyama B. Pekeno Guerrero, Tiger Mask and Grand Hamada B. Great Sasuke and Naohiro Hoshikawa, Koji Kiao B. Glenn Jacobs, Isaac Yonkem July 14, Cookville, Tennessee, USWA, Flex Cabana B. Leon Downs, Bart Sawyer B. Tony Falk, Miss Texas B. Fair and Square, Wolfie D. B. Bill Dundee, Unified Title, Doug Gilbert B. Jeff Jarrett DQ. July 14, Detroit, Insane Championship Wrestling, Rhino Richards B. Pierre Francois, Brian Fury B. Alex Machine, Loco Twister Tornado B. Christian Cage DQ, Killer Canarick and Gypsy B. Blacksmith and Briar Wellington and Rob Avram, Rick Matrix B. Dirty Tex, Headbangers B. Sex and Violence. July 15, Orlando Disney Studios, WCW Monday Nitro Tapings 450 Full House Slash All Freebies, Rick and Scott Steiner B. Scott Norton and Ice Train 2 Stars, Dean Malenko B. Billy Kidman 3 and a Quarter Stars, WCW Tag Titles, Harlem Heat B. Dick Slater and Mike Ennis 1 Half of 1 Star, 
Medusa B. Malia Hasaka 1 and 1 half star, Meng B. Arnold Anderson Dud, Eddie Guerrero B. Chris Benoit Core 3 and 1 half stars, WCW TV title, Lex Luger and C. Big Bubba Dud. July 15th, Tsujo, All Japan, 2100 Satoru Asako B. Yoshinobu Kanemaru, Bobby Duncombe Jr. B. Masao Inoue, Tsuyashi Kikuchi and Yoshinari Ogawa B. Chris and Mark Youngblood, Mighty Inoue and Haruka Aigen and Masafuchi B. Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momota, Patriot and Johnny Ace B. Tamon Honda and Takao Amori, Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Taubi Steve Williams and Monokia Mossman, Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenna Kobashi and Jun Akiyama B. Stan Hansen and Gary Albright and Johnny Smith. July 16th Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center, New Japan, 6,400 sellout, Akitoshi Saito and Akira Nagami and Kengo Kimura B. Yutaka Yoshi and Yuji Nagata and Junji Hirata, Osamu Kido B. Brad Armstrong, Satoshi Kojima and Osamu Nishimura B. Mishiyoshi Ohara and Tatsutoshi Goto. Jushin Liger and Norio Onaga and El Samurai B. Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Shinjiro Otani and Tokamitsu Ishizawa, Rick Flair B. Randy Savage, Sting and Great Muda B. Road Warriors, Shinya Hashimoto and Riki Chashu B. Tatsumi Fujinami and Shiro Koshinaka, WCW title, The Giant B. Power Warrior, Kensuke Sasaki, IWGP tag title, Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan B. Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka to win titles. Special thanks to Richard Riegler, Eddie Sharkey, Ron Lemieux, Etta Hearns, Greg John, Peggy Watkins, Dan Paris, Louis Crane, Dan Curtis, Marv Rubin, Georgie M. Macropolis, Dominic Valenti, David Milliken, Joel Lerman, Tim Wright, Jerry Lane, Steve Dr. Lucha Sims, Jesse Money, Joseph Mangiarachina Jr., Jacob Gilbert, Dean Ice, Billy Anderson, Frank Mutt, Greg Klein. Japanese Television Rundown June 23rd, All Japan. 1. Baba and Surita and Ogawa beat Izumida and Amori and Honda when Surita pinned Izumida with a back suplex. Basic comedy match. Dud. 2. Albright and Kimala 2 beat Kobashi and Mossman. The match was real good when Albright was in against either foe. Mossman and Albright have really improved as pro wrestlers over the past six months. The match went downhill when Kimala 2 was in, but overall he was okay. Mossman is going to be a superstar someday, and that day may be fairly soon. There was a huge pop when Mossman gave two a moonsault off the middle rope because people thought it might be an upset. Finally two pinned Mossman with a splash off the top rope. Three and a quarter stars. June 30th All Japan. 1. Williams pinned Mossman after a doctor bomb. Williams gave Mossman a lot of offense in this match. Mossman throws kicks about as well as any non-Japanese wrestler in the entire business. Williams even let Mossman kick out of his Oklahoma stampede. Two and a half stars. 2. Misawa and Akiyama beat Kobashi and Diet. This was not only Diet's first television match, but it was as a Karako and Hall main event. They announced him as a former outside linebacker for the Denver Broncos and New Orleans Saints. I'm assuming he went to camp with those teams but never made the teams. He's only been wrestling two months and is a protege of Williams. He's got height with a live build, kind of like a taller Joel Deaton but it was way too early for him to be in a main event. He wasn't like an Akiyama or a Juventud Guerrero where you could pretty well see he was going to be a superstar from his first match. He's probably better than McMichael as a technician but doesn't have McMichael's ring personality, although in this promotion that really wouldn't mean much anyway. They are having him do basically a combination Niagara driver and diesel jackknife as a finisher, but he screwed it up badly three times as he couldn't get Akiyama on his shoulders. Once he couldn't get him up, another time he collapsed with him on his shoulders and a third time he clumsily got him in the position. Finally Akiyama pinned Diet after two exploiter suplexes. The other three were all excellent. Two and three quarter stars. EMLL. Don't have much in the way of news, but the biggest matches of the past week were a hair versus hair match with La Fiera versus Cajos on July 9th at Arena Coliseo, and the main show of the week on July 12th at Arena Mexico was headlined by Rio de Jalisco Jr. and Atlantis and Elio del Santo vs. Kanek and Apollo Dantes and Negro Casas which was done to set up a tag title match. Plus Lismark and Shocker and Bronco vs. El Satanico and Bestia Salvaje and Black Warrior to set up Black Warrior vs. Bronco in a mask vs. mask match. The July 19th Arena Mexico show is headlined by Rio and Atlantis defending the CMLL tag titles against Kanek and Dantes and the Warrior Bronco mask match along with Vampiro and Mascara Sagrada and Dos Cars vs. Mascara Año 2000 and Universo 2000 and Mono Negra, and the EMLL return of Martha Villalobos jumping from AAA. 
Satanico defends the CMLL middleweight title against Lismark on July 21 at Arena Coliseo. AAA. The major show of the week was July 12 in Sakatekas with them attempting to repeat the angle that put business over the top last year Pero Agueo getting busted open with a beer bottle. This time it was Viano 3 who did the honors. Pero Agueo Jr., who has been out of action since December since his father wanted him to put on more weight before returning, pretty much made his return doing a run-in after the angle. Super Muñeco who is a full-fledged hill now turned on mini Super Muñequito in the undercard. Mascara de Sagrada Jr. did the move of the show, a Hector Garza corkscrew plancha from the top rope to the floor, made more amazing since he can't be three feet tall. Title situation this week was really strange. In both Phoenix and Los Angeles, Rey Mysterio Jr. went into the ring with the Mexican welterweight title and in both cities lost it in two straight falls to psychosis in matches that were major disappointments. Both guys were banged up, particularly their knees, from all the hot moves they had done for WCW, and Mysterio Jr. had to save himself with Triple Mania and the War Sumo Hall dates upcoming, but even so, could you imagine those two doing a one and one quarter stars match? In Tijuana, La Parca came to the ring with the IWAS heavyweight title belt, which Conan holds, but they built it as a light heavyweight title match, which Damian last held only a few weeks ago, and retained it beating Misterioso in a very good match that went about 25 minutes and had near falls and topes galore in the third fall. Parka was the star of the show. WCW decided against using Parka because they felt American fans wouldn't like his costume or his comedy but invited him to come in sans both and he didn't want to do so. It appears right now they've learned from some of the smaller US offices to just bill whomever is whatever champion and throw a belt on him for the house shows. The undercard saw women's triangular matches with Shitara, Natasha and La Sirenita that can be best described as among the worst matches ever. In more ECW type stuff, Pierroth Jr. ended up slapping, punching and kicking Sirenita after the matches. There was one impressive newcomer called Bad Blood, a skinny manager who was very active around ringside and took some great bumps. Real name BJ Darden from San Pedro, California, 22. All Japan. Basically an eventful week leading up to the Budokan show. The only major card of the week was July 11th in Hakata Star Lanes before a sellout 2500 with a somewhat unique main event where Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tao and Masa Fuchi beat Giant Baba and Mitsuharu Misawa and Talon Honda when Tao pinned Honda and Kenna Kobashi went to a 30-minute draw against Jun Akiyama. July 7th TV show did a 1.8 rating. New Japan. The first of the two nights in Sapporo on July 16th drew a sellout 6,400 fans with Ric Flair, Randy Savage, Sting and the Giant from WCW on the card. Giant retained the WCW title pinning power warrior, Kensuke Sasaki, with a choke slam in 4.53 in a match fans got into. It must have looked like quite a size difference because without anything in his boots, Power is legitimately around 5 foot 7. Sting teamed with Great Muda to beat the Road Warriors when Muda pinned Hawk. It was the first loss for the Road Warriors, who had worked six mans with Power Warrior, thus far in the tour. Since they were building to a Shinya Hashimoto IWGP title defense on July 17 against Ric Flair, it meant that Flair had to go over on Randy Savage, which he did in 1127. The only report we got is the crowd was dead for this match as the Sapporo fans weren't into the guys working American style. The main event on the show saw Masa Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan capture the IWGP tag team titles beating Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka, who had held the titles only five weeks, when Chono used the SDF on Izuka in 2217. Yamazaki missed part of the tour with an injury and Chono and Tenzan mainly worked him over during the match. The other top match on the show was Hashimoto and Riki Chashu beat Tatsumi Fujinami and Shiro Koshinaka when Hashimoto pinned Fujinami with a high angle DDT in 1035. The July 17th show, besides Hashimoto vs. Flair, had Giant vs. Sting and Savage vs. Jushin Liger, so Savage could split matches on the tour. The rest of the tour had nothing really special and nothing special crowds either. The final wrestler in the junior heavyweight tournament at G1 still hasn't been announced. TV ratings for the show moved to a Monday 2 a.m. time slot on July 1st only did in 0.9, but they rebounded back to a 2.6 in the regular time slot on July 6th. Other Japan notes. We still only have sketchy details on the injuries suffered by Boss Rutten in a July 4th auto accident in Holland. According to the reports, injuries haven't been specified but Rutten is expected to be bedridden until the end of the month and it is questionable whether he'll recover in time for his scheduled September 7th title match against Masakatsu Fanaki. Apparently Tarzan Yamamoto, after leaving Weekly Pro Wrestling in the wake of the war with New Japan, 
said that by his leaving that it was a sign that any journalism within Japanese pro wrestling is now dead. Actually, we've gotten somewhat of a different response from people this week in Japan. Yamamoto had made a lot of enemies and there were people happy to see him lose the war. However, now that everyone has really thought about the repercussions of this, we are getting people who recognize just how dangerous the results of this story are and that it gives New Japan a dangerous amount of power when it comes to controlling the media. The line between shooting and working continues to grow thinner. On July 14th, there was a card of shoot boxing, a Japanese shoot sport that combines kickboxing with wrestling throws, trips and takedowns, no ground work, at Ariaki Coliseum, and on the card was a UFC rules match between Kimo and Kazushi Sakuraba of UWFI. Kimo won the match in 420 with a shoulder submission. However, after the match, it was announced that Kimo had signed for two matches with UWFI on its stadium shows, facing Yoshihiro Takayama on August 17th at Jingu Stadium and facing Yoji Anjo on the September 11th Jingu Stadium show. They even did a pro wrestling angle out of it as if Kimo loses to Anjo, he must join the Golden Cups, so clearly this entire thing is a storyline to make Kimo a pro wrestler, and thus Sakuraba needed to put him over to give him credibility for the bigger matches down the line. In a similar vein, that same day, there was a pro wrestling show billed as the martial arts festival at Karakuen Hall with Koji Kiao in a UFC match against Glenn Jacobs, Isaac Yonkem from WWF, with Kiao winning with a sleeper in 327. Clearly Jacobs was there to put Kiao over since Kiao's rep took a pounding from Mark Hall and Pedro Otarvio in real matches. We pretty much know that an American pro wrestler with some shoot background was asked to work for Kiao to put Kiao over and rebuild Kiao's reputation. Since the Kimo match was on a shoot show and the fans went in thinking shooting, it's one thing. The Kiao Jacobs match was on a pro wrestling show, so basically in context it was more like the Taz Paul Verlins deal rather than a fixed shoot match. UWFI announced the following for the August 17th Jingu Stadium show Takata vs. Anjo, Genichiro Tenryu vs. Rumored to be Tarzan Goto, Satoru Sayama vs. Gran Hamada, Yuhisano vs. Takayama vs. Kimo, Great Kabuki and Daiko Kubo Benkei and vs. Kishin Kawabata and Shigeo Okamura and Gekko in a six-man from Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Hiromitsu Kaneara vs. Ilumaduro and Kenichi Yamamoto vs. Dutch Windmill. With no New Japan involvement, this is a terrible lineup for such a major show. FMW announced the main event of its outdoor show on August 1st at the Tokyo Shio Dome as Terry Funk vs. Mr. Pogo in an electrified explosive match. Funk will be the heel as Pogo just turned face in FMW. The other top matches of the FMW tour that starts July 21st at Karakuen Hall will be the semifinals of the group's tournament to crown an independent world heavyweight champion with Wing Kanemura vs. Super Leather and Masato Tanaka vs. Hisakatsu Oya, title match will be on the August 1st show, and on July 31st we'll have the six-man street fight world title with Tanaka and Koji Nakagawa and Tetsuhiro Kuroda defending against the Gladiator and Oya and Riki Fuji. Tokyo Pro Wrestling begins its next tour on July 23rd with Sabu, Abdullah the Butcher, Billy Black and Black Wayzama, Two Cold Scorpio, among others. The first show will be a free outdoor show at Atami Sun Beach as part of an outdoor fireworks festival similar to WCW's Bash at the Beach and the expectation is that this will draw tons more than WCW did under the same circumstances. They run Karaku and Hall on July 24th with Sabu vs. Weizama and Takashi Ishikawa and Anjo and Kawabata vs. Abdullah and Black and Benkei. Oleg Takdorov signed to work the Universal Valley Tudo show on August 4th at Tokyo Bay NK Hall. They are trying to put together a main event against Marco Ruiz, but that hasn't been put together as of yet. Pancrase announced its shows for July 22nd and July 23rd, both at Karaku and Hall. The highlight will be the Neo Blood, New Blood basically, tournament with the first round matches being Asami Shibuya vs. Kim Jong Won of Korea, Kun Yoku Kiyuma vs. Peter Williams, making his Pancrase debut, Kenichiro Yamamiya making his debut vs. Satoshi Hasegawa, also making his debut, and the top match of the first round will be Yuki Kondo vs. Semishult. Two other matches will be Ryushi Yanagisawa vs. Yoshiki Takahashi and Frank Shamrock vs. Manabu Yamada. The July 23rd show will have the semifinals and finals of the tournament, plus Funaki vs. Takafumi Ito and Minoru Suzuki vs. Vernon White. The main event on the ring's August 24th show at the Ariaki Coliseum will be Yoshihisa Yamamoto vs. Ricardo Morais, a Brazilian who will be managed by Henzo Gracie that won one of the UFC events in Russia. Morris is listed at 6'8", 250, and is a Gracie student from Rio de Janeiro. 
as I said the line grows thinner as this would be the first Gracie family remember to participate in what is pro wrestling. All Japan Women opened its singles Grand Prix tournament to determine the contenders' ratings for Minami Toyota's world belt on July 14 at Karakuen Hall. In the main event, Yumiko Hata, who is getting the monster push as the shooter, beat Asia Kong in 14.06 with a chicken wing cross face, while other first day tourney results saw Takako Inoue beat Tomoko Watanabe, Mima Shimoda over Kaoru Ito, and Reggie Bennett over Tashio Yamada. USWA because he had to stay in Connecticut an extra day to film the impromptu angle where Sid replaced Ultimate Warrior in the pay-per-view main event, Ahmed Johnson no-showed the main event on the July 8th show and was replaced by Brian Christopher, who beat Jeff Jarrett via DQ when Tony Falk interfered. Also on the show, Terry Lawler and Bill Dundee lost the USWA tag titles back to Bart Sawyer and Flex Cabana in a match where Cabana put up his hair. The July 15th show was scheduled to have Jarrett defend against Sid Vicious. ECW other notes from the July 13th ECW Arena. Inside Edition was their filming for an upcoming segment. The opener saw the gangsters destroy the Samoan Gangsta Tribe in 2.30. This was basically Heyman having an ECW team destroy a WWF team, even though the latter never actually worked as a team on WWF television other than standing in the aisle. Mikey Whipwreck beat Paul Loria, and after the match the Eliminators did a run-in and destroyed Mikey and then challenged Sabu. Mikey and Sabu came out for an impromptu tag match which was said to have been very good, ending when they used the total elimination on Mikey. The Dudleys, Bubba Ray and Dances with and Big Dick, meet JT Smith and Little Guido and Big Guido, area indie wrestler Primo Carnera 3, in a match reported as being totally messed up when Dick pinned Big Guido. The match was basically to set up another Big Dick vs. D. Von confrontation which got great heat. On July 12th in Allentown, Pennsylvania before an estimated 900 main event saw Terry Gordy and Tommy Dreamer beat Raven and Brian Lee in a brawl all over the building, Eliminators beat Gangsters in a bloody bath among the top matches. Crowd was pretty hot for most of the show. Best match was said to have been a draw with Chris Jericho defending the TV title against Shane Douglas. There were some reported bad matches on the show as well, Sebu vs. Hack Myers and in particular a bad crew tag match against Havoc Incorporated that was embarrassing. Only matches we know of for August 3rd at ECW Arena are Sabu vs. Rob Van Dam in a stretcher match, Eliminators, Gangsters, Samoan Gangsta Tribe and Bruise Brothers in a Four Corners tag match and perhaps Sandman vs. Raven for the title although that hasn't been confirmed. Talk of people like Vampiro, Dr. Wagner Jr. and Johnny Smith headed in. On Los Angeles Prime, not sure if this holds true for anywhere else, the show has been moved from 2 a.m. on Friday nights to 3 a.m. on Monday nights. Exaggeration of the Week the three-table bump Dreamer took on the previous show off the elevated section near the balcony was billed on television as a 25-foot drop. If it was then the Bruce brothers, who were setting up the table, are about 23 feet tall each. Here and there. There will be a memorial barbecue for Dick Murdoch on July 28 at the Caravan Club on 3801 Olson Boulevard in Amarillo at 3 p.m. with a band playing at night. A correction from last week's issue. Hulk Hogan's AWA Arena debut where the fans turned him babyface on August 9, 1981 took place at the Minneapolis Auditorium rather than the St. Paul Civic Center as reported. The return of the AWA, basically Dale Gagner using the name to promote shows but with no involvement of Ganya's, on July 8th in Rochester, Minnesota ended up being a three-match show with Nails vs. Charlie Norris on top. Johnny Stewart became the new AWA heavyweight champion beating Twin Turbo in a match to determine the champ. Former pro wrestler Ray Eckert, who was a star in the 40s and 50s, passed away this past week at the age of 79. Border City Wrestling on August 16th in LaSalle, ONT is holding the Mickey Doyle retirement show with Doyle and Scott Damore vs. Zip and Leaf Cassidy, Doink vs. Brooklyn Brawler and Dan Severn, billed in his only pro wrestling match in the Detroit area in 1996, versus Geza Coleman Jr. The July 12th USA Pro Wrestling Show in Birmingham, Alabama which went head-to-head -head with UFC using Bob Armstrong, Tommy Rich and Abdullah the Butcher drew approximately 800, which isn't bad for an indie these days. Don't have results but Abdullah no showed. Sunshine Wrestling Federation on July 22nd in Miami and Dave and Mary Alper JCC. Ray Camarina, a Bill Anderson trainee known as Dick Danger, suffered a head injury on July 7th when he cracked his head on the floor doing a dive in a match in San Bernardino. An ambulance had to be called, but Camarina is doing fine now. UFC The August issue of Mad Magazine had a UFC spoof. Syracuse, New York is still the tentative site for the September 20th pay-per-view show, although on the broadcast when announcing the next date, 
no location was announced nor was an announcement made about ticket sales. The bill to regulate UFC in New York passed the state legislature 148-0 on July 12, so it is being sent to Governor Pataki. The law won't go into effect until 120 days after the governor signs it, if he does, but since it won by that high a margin, a veto appears would be easily overridden, so legally that wouldn't affect the Syracuse deal. When warming up for the 600 bench on television, Abbott repped out with 500. WCW Nitro on July 15 at Disney Studios saw Rick and Scott Steiner beat Ice Train and Scott Norton in 1043 when Rick pinned Train with a German suplex after Train accidentally splashed Norton when Rick moved. After the match they did an interview where Teddy Long came out to act as the peacemaker, and Norton shoved him down, which infuriated Train. It looked staged to the max. Dean Malenko beat Billy Kidman in 513 with a Texas Cloverleaf in a match where both guys looked great. Kidman has a lot of potential. Kevin Green, who got no pop, challenged Steve McMichael right then and there since he started camp the next day. Harlem Heat kept the tag titles beating Dick Slater and Mike Enos in 739 when Sherry kissed Slater, who was then schoolboy by Booker T. In WWF, guys lose when they get kissed by a member of the same sex, in WCW they lose when they kissed by a member of the opposite sex. Medusa beat Malia Hasaka in 407 with a German suplex. It was okay. They tried to act like Hasaka was a Japanese wrestler. Well, she's of Japanese ancestry. Kevin Nash and Scott Hall then put the letters NWO over the WCW letters. Fans were chanting Razor and Diesel at them and they were total babyfaces. Meng pinned Arnold Anderson when Barbarian interfered in 1058. Terrible match. Well, it was what the finish was supposed to be anyway, although Barbarian basically missed the clothesline that was to lead to the finish. Michael and his wife came out. Deborah wasn't polished but whoever came up with what she said did a great job. They challenged Green, who had already left. Eddie Guerrero beat Chris Benoit via count out in 938 when Malenko posted Benoit in a three and one half stars match. Finale saw a TV title match with Lex Luger vs. Bubba ending with no decision when Nash and Hall came out at 1130. Nash jackknifed Luger and Hulk Hogan came out and slapped him around. Hogan then shook Bubba's hand but Hall and Nash jumped him and they beat him up as well. Hogan did another good interview with the main line saying that Savage has blamed him for three years about breaking up their marriage when it was Savage who couldn't rise to the occasion. Fans threw a ton of stuff at Hogan once again. It looked staged on television because it was all empty plastic bottles, but those live said it was definitely not staged and they were going after fans left and right because fans were nearly getting hit with all the stuff thrown. They tried to make Hogan a heel but 60% of the crowd was for him but he turned himself into a heel with his interview. Earlier in the show the fans were chanting for Hogan. Steiners, Mang, Barbarian and Anderson all came out and surrounded the ring while Hogan, Nash and Hall were in the ring as the show went off the air. They really buried their own talent in the commentary because the entire show had the announcers say that with Sting, Flair, Savage and Giant gone, that the only one left was Luger, since he was the one they were doing the angle with, which pretty much tells everyone where the rest of the wrestlers stand. The Disney studio they do Nitro it holds 450 people, and the reservations are full through early August. I don't like the look of the TV show at Disney because you feel like you're watching Little League Baseball or Adult Softball in these makeshift grandstands, but there isn't much of a choice since all the Turner trucks are covering the Olympics. It was a better show than most of the two-hour shows. TV ratings the past two weeks. For July 8th, Nitro did a 3.5 and 6.3 share, 3.3 first hour, 3.7 seconds hour, as compared with Raw doing a 2.5 and 4.1 share. Nitro Replay did a 1.6 and 3.8 share, once again breaking the all-time record. For July 15th, built around Hogan, the show did a 3.4 rating and 5.8 share, 3.3 and 3.5 in respective hours, do a 2.6 and 4.2 for Raw. Nitro Replay did a 1.8, breaking the record yet again, with a 4.2 share. Other ratings for the weekend of July 6th saw WCW Saturday Night do a 2.5, main event a 2.2 and Pro a 1.3, while for July 13th, Saturday did a 3.0 which is phenomenal for the summer, main event a 2.0 and Pro a 1.5. Complete lineup for the Hog Wild pay-per-view show on August 10th is Giant vs. Hogan, billed now as Hollywood Hulk Hogan, Luger and Sting vs. Hall and Nash, Flair defends U.S. title against Guerrero, Harlem Heat defends tag titles against Steiners, Rey Mysterio Jr. defends cruiserweight title against Ultimo Dragon, Benoit vs. Malenko, Medusa vs. Bull Nakano with the loser getting their motorcycle destroyed by the winner and Ice Train vs. Norton. 
The week was spent at Disney with tapings every night. The Saturday night show was taped on July 9. About the only item of interest was the debut of the Leprechaun, Buddy Lee Parker, real name Dwayne Bruce, as a member of the Dungeon of Doom who likes Jimmy Hart but is afraid of Kevin Sullivan. Mysterio Jr. beat Psychosis in a quickie. They had a screw-up in that the cheerleaders thought Greg Valentine was a face so they had the crowd cheer him wildly to make it appear he was really over. Conan wore an eye patch selling the lousy high heel hit from the pay-per-view in a match with Top Gun, David Kennel. Conan did a run-in in a horseman match but wound up getting beaten on, while main event saw Harlem Heat beat Public Enemy. During a week, besides tapings, they ran regular matches as attractions at Disney, two matches every few hours to give young guys experience. However, the odds of WCW moving its offices from Atlanta to Disney appear to have decreased from most accounts. Nash and Hall are working house shows against Luger and Sting starting July 24 in Cincinnati. For Baltimore on August 16, it'll be Giant vs. Savage, Hall and Nash vs. Sting and Luger, Flair vs. Conan, Sullivan vs. Benoit, Falls Count Anywhere, Mysterio Jr. vs. Psychosis, Guerrero vs. Anderson, Steiners vs. Public Enemy and Regal vs. Malenko. Upcoming Nitros after they are done at Disney will be August 12th in Casper, Wyoming, August 19th in Huntsville, Alabama, August 26th in Palmetto, Florida, September 2nd in Chattanooga, September 9th in Columbus, Georgia, September 16th in Asheville, September 23rd in Roanoke, and September 30th in Cleveland. Tapings for Saturday night will be at Disney until August 13th in Colorado Springs, August 20th in Dalton, Georgia, August 27th back at Disney, September 4th in Gainesville, Georgia, September 11th in Macon, Georgia, September 18th in Dalton, Georgia, and September 25th in Anderson, South Carolina. Not a lot of news value out of the Disney tapings for Worldwide. Psychosis had a very good match with Billy Kidman. Kidman was put over clean, and you can make what you want out of that. Actually they taped three good matches in a row at one point, with that bout. Blue Bloods vs. Scott and Steve Armstrong and a Chris Benoit win over Eddie Guerrero. Besides Leprechaun, the only newcomer at the tapings was Chavo Guerrero Jr., real name Salvador Guerrero III, who tagged with Eddie and was said to have looked pretty good. Norton worked matches as a heel. Still no sign of Blood Runs Cold, who were supposed to debut this month. The WWF slash WCW lawsuit is getting serious as depositions are being taken. Amazing coincidence department. A newsletter called Ambivalent Response, 65-0579 PL, Queens, New York, 11379 kind of heavily intellectual coverage of wrestling, made a comment about the Mysterio Jr. vs. Psychosis match, not from the pay-per-view but from the J-Cup in December saying it may prove to be, not the first pro wrestling match of the 21st century, but the last of the 20th century, eerily similar to a reader's comment regarding last week's match. WWF The latest on the Jim Helwig saga is, Despite all sorts of rumors, no change from last week. Vince McMahon said on Raw that Helwig's lawyer and WWF have had dialogue so they were keeping his name alive, but Titan has made no plans for his return nor is he written into future plans. The story is the appearance bond he's supposed to place before being allowed back will be closer to $250,000 than $100,000. Helwig made an online message that largely made no sense in response to claims he missed the show due to a contract dispute, saying he missed the shows because his father passed away and denied it was contractually related, and said, if resolving my personal issues and protecting the way I chose to believe puts me in the WWF doghouse as stated on the money-making 1-900 line, then so be it. Bow wow and kiss my ass. Always believe. Helwig's father, Tom Helwig passed away at the age of 58 on June 30th in Hollywood, Florida, and as everyone continually points out, Helwig missed shows both on June 28th and June 29th. McMahon mentioned the death of Brett and Owen Hart's nephew on Raw. Expect major changes in television come September. Syndication is expected to take yet another hit so WWF will be more reliant than ever on cable. Kevin Kelly debuted on the air doing voiceovers of the Superstars matches for the Action Zone and Mania shows with Jim Ross doing color. There is unhappiness among the talent regarding Helwig walking out, but there is also feeling that he's done it before and he was still pushed to the moon when he came back. For similar reasons, the Sid situation has similar feelings in that Sid is a poor worker, and he was never over like Warrior was, has a shoddy track record and the minute he comes back, he's again pushed to the moon ahead of guys who have a better track record and more ability and some who have as big or bigger names. Timing is everything. Sid is even more limited as a worker this time because he suffered a serious neck injury last year and is afraid because of warnings from his doctor to take any bumps. That's one of the reasons they are doing all these one-minute matches with him. 
cable ratings for the past two weekends was weekend of July 6th saw Mania and 1.3 and Action Zone at 1.7, and for July 13th, Mania did 1.3 and Action Zone 1.5. The situation with Davy Boy Smith is that Linda McMahon sent a five-year contract to his lawyer but at press time he hasn't signed it although the delay may be partially because of the family tragedy. Barry Windham was also sent a contract but had signed at press time but is expected to sign. Weekend house shows were July 11th in Albany, New York drawing $4,579 and $66,946, July 12th in Worcester, Massachusetts drawing $4,556 and $73,630, July 13th in Portland, Maine drawing $3,314 and $52,529, and July 14th in Bangor, Maine drawing $2,022 and $34,238. Results were the same every night, with Shawn Michaels over Vader on top in 5 to 8 minutes with the super kick, Sid getting the quick win over Bulldog, Body Down is winning the four team, etc. The Ahmed Johnson Goldust finishes saw Johnson first win via count out, but after the match he kept giving Goldust Pearl River plunges until the ref DQ'd him. In all cities, they announced about Warrior not being there and offered refunds. In Albany, they already put tickets on sale at the show for a raw taping which takes place on December 30th. WWF has pulled out of Boston because the rent and union costs of running the new Fleet Center make break-even too high, so they'll concentrate on the Worcester Centrum instead. They did a segment with TJ Hopper as a plumber with him bending over as his pants going down and his butt showing. Both Kurt Hennig and Jerry Lawler on the respective shows came back with the same no to crack line. On Raw on July 15th, they ran a storyline throughout the show taped a few days earlier in Hartford, Connecticut, not at a house show. They just brought the guys to the Civic Center and spliced it into the show as an angle where Camp Cornet ambushed Michaels and Johnson and Sid came driving up in a Lincoln and nearly crashed into the building before chasing the heels away into their own car. It wasn't a good angle, actually it was pretty lame, but it was good that they got something done. Originally in the show for that week was the angle where Warrior, Michaels and Johnson made the comeback on Camp Cornet in the ring taped in Green Bay. McMahon is making an effort to sign a lot of the key guys to five-year deals as he apparently wants to avoid more Hall-slash-Nash situations. 1-2-3 Kid was given his release this past week and he's expected to join WCW's Outsiders. WWF will be running simultaneous international tours in December, one group going to Korea, Australia, Singapore and Philippines, and the other to United Kingdom and United Arab Emirates. Raymond Roju is said to have lost 20 pounds and is even cut training for his match with Owen Hart on August 2nd. The Reader's Pages WCW There have been numerous comments about the momentum lost by WCW from the lackluster Monday Nitro broadcast from Disney on July 8 following the incredible Hulk Hogan angle at the previous night's pay-per-view show. I agree with those comments 100%. However, the problem with Nitro had little to do with the performance of the wrestlers or even the booking. It was the setting and the crowd. I've attended many Disney tapings over the past two years. Admittedly, the set looks good on television, and WCW loves going there, due to the state-of-the-art equipment, the red carpet treatment from Disney officials, and ongoing negotiations concerning a long-term Disney relationship. As has been reported, the vast majority of attendees at Disney tapings aren't wrestling fans. The crowd mainly consists of Disney Park visitors looking for a quick respite from the heat. As for the crowd for the July 8th Nitro, I'd be willing to bet that less than 10% of them attended, saw or were even aware of what happened at the previous night's pay-per-view show. I'm not even sure if the front row that was on camera knew they were at a pro wrestling taping, or they were at the Indiana Jones stunt exhibit across the street. Additionally, the lackadaisical exiting of the crowd directly behind Nash and Hall being interviewed by Gene Okerlund at the end of the show looked real bad. I attended the show in Daytona Beach. The heat, anger and emotion from the crowd at the end was unlike anything I've seen in more than 20 years of going to wrestling matches. One of the guys I was with commented that it was reminiscent of the near-right mentality of a 1970s crowd in the Midwest when Ernie Ladd turned heel. WCW's brass needs to realize that real, non-manufactured emotion must be captured on the company's number one television show in order to give credibility to their angles. The Disney setting is fine for shows such as WCW Pro and Worldwide, which usually feature non-competitive matches, but for Nitro, Saturday Night, Clashes and Pay-Per-View shows, it's all wrong. Name withheld by request. One thing I'd like to point out about the angle being challenged by Vince McMahon on some of the legal charges. There is a Pepsi commercial that still airs that shows a man in a Coke outfit putting Cokes in the cooler, and then trying to sneak a Pepsi, and having the cooler spill its load. 
This sounds like a perfect parallel to the WWF's charges of copyright infringement, and in particular trade dress infringement and false and misleading descriptions. One would think as big a cola war that's out there that Coke would, if they could win, file similar charges. If Choke refused to file charges, why should a court waste time hearing the same charges in a pro wrestling dispute? The man dressed in the Coke outfit is Nash and Hall. He's portraying a Coca Cola employee in getting caught with his hand in the cookie jar, when we all know he really works for Pepsi. I don't see any trailers saying this man does not work for Coca Cola, and his portrayal of a Coca Cola employee, when he in fact is a Pepsi Co employee, is merely false advertising on the part of Pepsi Co, and should not be construed as working for Coca Cola. Joey Sprinkle. Roseburg, Oregon. Olympic article. I enjoyed the article about the Olympics very much, but it raised an interesting question. How good were the so-called shooters of pro wrestling? For instance, you mentioned that Carl Gotch is generally considered one of, if not the best, shooter by the other wrestlers. But he didn't even medal in the Olympics. It seems that, with just a few exceptions, when those who later turned pro were competing in real contests against the best in the world, it came up short. And most of those who did win gold medals didn't stay in pro wrestling very long. Don't get me wrong. I know it's a great feat to be a national champion or just to make an Olympic team. But to be a world champion or Olympic champion means taking it up to another level. In a couple of recent articles you've mentioned a book called Wrestling Title Histories. I'd appreciate it very much if you could print ordering information for the book. Charles Oliver. Los Angeles, California. DM the book is available for $40 from Royal Duncan, 7600 North Galena Road, Peoria, Illinois 61615. Pancras. Allow me to interject my opinion of Pancras. The recent pay-per-view confirmed my long-standing belief that Pancras is a shoot. Sure, there are instances of showboating but isn't that the case in almost every sport? If Pancras is a work, the matches would have a different kind of entertainment value, which they don't. They would have longer time limits so they could build up drama. The wrestlers would sell moves, which they don't. The Japanese top stars would win more often than they do. From the very beginning, I've always believed Pancrase was legit. Let's look at the first show they ever ran. On September 21, 1993 at Tokyo Bay NK Hall, there were five matches. Collectively, they lasted a total of 15 minutes with the longest match lasting six minutes. No pro wrestling promoter would ever book a show to run that short. I doubt anyone would pay the high ticket prices they charge if there was even a hint that what they were seeing wasn't real. I enjoyed Pancrase more than UFC because the style has more discipline and sophistication to it. Pancrase wrestlers are better technically than their UFC counterparts so their matches are more entertaining to watch. However, most of the time, but not always, I prefer fake over real for reasons of escapism and its ability to build drama and for entertainment value. With all the air time given lately to woman, Elizabeth, Deborah McMichael, Sonny, Diana Smith, Sable, etc. not to mention the cast of lesbians and bimbos in ECW, I'm glad to see the women's side of pro wrestling isn't being ignored. All we need now is the revival of Glow. Meanwhile in Japan, Megumi Kudo is getting herself cut to shreds in her quest to become the female Onita. Well, Bruce Lee begat Angela Mao and Sunny Chiba begat Yukari Oshima. I should have been Kudo's career path coming. The pictures from her barbed wire match on the May 5th Kawasaki Stadium show in weekly pro wrestling were brutal. I wonder what Kudo or the other women who get kicked stiffly in the face have if they knew if they came to the United States, all they would have to do is engage in little sexual innuendo and stereotypical roles. Their integrity as performers would be shot, but their health wouldn't be at risk. It's ironic to see the roles women play in pro wrestling here and in Japan. It's like a reversal of real life. American women in general play significant roles in our society and are considered equals to men in most business, pro wrestling being a rare exception. Japanese women play a less significant subservient role in their society and are expected to stay home and raise children, although that perception has changed in recent years. The ECW TV is starting to go downhill. There are several things about the show which I usually don't pay attention to that are now getting on my nerves. They've gone back to showing only one entire match per show, leaving too much time for countless promos. I'm not interested in seeing who is wrestling in Glen Olden, Pennsylvania 20 times in an hour. I won't vote for Joey Styles for best announcer anymore no matter how many moves he calls correctly. I've never minded that his style is loud and overbearing, but week after week, he's turning into an Eric Bischoff type of shill. Styles is now as annoying as the fans who chant ECW just because somebody does a crazy move. Like no wrestlers ever used tables or chairs or did crazy flying moves in other promotions. 
I could name at least a half dozen promotions worldwide that ECW has either copied from or been influenced by. I also don't see the appeal of Tommy Dreamer. I've seen him in person and he comes across as a very likable person, but the persona he plays on television is another story. On television he comes off as arrogant and unlikable. He's just an average wrestler doing a hardcore gimmick. I guess he needs to put this rough edge on his personality in order to appeal to the ECW fans. If I see any more of Shane Douglas' self-absorbed interviews, I'll kick in my TV screen. I'm hopeful ECW will revert back to last year's form because if it doesn't, I'm voting for Monday Night Raw as the best show in this year's awards. In 1996, it has been the most entertaining hour of wrestling. Ramon Lores. Flushing, New York. ECW I recently read your description of the first Sabu Rob Van Dam match in ECW and all I can say is, what the hell is your problem? In my opinion, and that of just about everybody who saw it, the match was amazing and one of the three best matches in this country thus far this year. You said the match had only one element and went on to say there were tons of missed spots, no intensity and no believability. Is this really how you saw this match? This is one of the most asinine descriptions I've ever read and I feel that it embarrassed you as a writer, embarrassed your publication and embarrassed every one of your subscribers. The match I saw on TV was 20 minutes of amazing intensity with the crowd going crazy for every move and the guys selling every single move like they were dead. The intensity was unmatched by any match I've seen in this country for five years. Tons of missed spots. I saw one missed clothesline by Sabu, and it still grazed Van Damme's head. Other than that, the match was nearly flawless. They did hundreds of crazy spots and connected amazingly on every single one of them. Match were you watching? No believability. When I see them fighting on a table without it giving way but then I see Sabu fly through it, I believe that it really hurt. When I see them nailing each other with stiff kicks and punches, pulling out every move in their respective arsenal, and nailing each other hard with chairs, it looks a lot more believable than anything else I can imagine. What are you expecting from a worked match to be believable? When I watch a worked match with Rey Mysterio Jr. and Psychosis, I love every minute of it even though I realize that nothing they do would actually be possible in a shoot. That style of match is not believable on any level. But I love it and you love it. So why blast Sabu and Van Damme for not having believable, intense matches but praise Mysterio Jr. and Psychosis? You also said they resemble the Sabu imitators that have no clue how to work a match. Your description totally lacked validity. I've seen El Puerto Ricano, Devon Storm and all the other Sabu imitators and none of them has ever worked a match the caliber of what Sabu and Van Damme did. Then you said the match looked as fake as a prelim match with green indie guys. Explain this ridiculous and stupid statement. They worked their asses off. They bent chairs. They broke tables. They dropped each other on their heads. They dropped each other on the floor. They did daredevil flips and leaps into the crowd and never stopped the entire match. They even mixed in some good solid mat wrestling, power moves and submission moves. Finally you said that the majority of the wrestlers in WWF and WCW would see this match and think it was terrible. What right would Shark have to watch this match and say it was awful? Or Duggan? Or Hogan? Or Meng? Or Yokozuna? Or Undertaker? None of these men have worked a decent match in the last 10 years and some in their entire career. The talent roster of WWF and WCW would have no right criticizing this match because they all wish they could put on the kind of performance Sabu and Van Dam did. When has a crowd ever watched a match with Big Bubba and cared? So if he watched the match, saw the crowd chanting both men's name and the name of the promotion and say they aren't any better than me? That's bull. Lastly, I have a couple of comments for Stephen Grant. He said that ECW is about as real as Bushwhackers matches. When I see Sandman and Pitbull No. 2 take chair shots to the head that bend the chair without putting so much as a hand up, I believe it. When I see Sandman put welts on jobbers' backs with a cane, I really think he is really destroying them because I can see the damage. In ECW, guys legitimately get metal chairs bent over their heads, get put through thick tables, bend metal guard rails with their bodies and have the most believable looking brawls I've ever seen when I see someone run to the ring with a garbage pail full of weapons and beat the hell out of whomever is in front of them. I've never seen wrestling as believable looking as ECW in this country. Why don't you ask Brian Lee to throw you off the upper stage or choke slam you through two tables, or ask Sabu to DDT you through a table and see if it's believable? ECW is the best wrestling I've ever seen in this country, and I've been afar for about 12 years. It amazes me how people try and downgrade the greatness of ECW just because they aren't as big as the two garbage wrestling promotions that I'm forced to watch every Monday night and forced to read about the next Monday. The next time you watch ECW TV, 
please remove your head from your ass before reviewing the matches and give a fair and unbiased opinion to the readers of your publication and try and regain your now lost credibility. Andrew Kessler. Brooklyn, New York. Japan. Although I'm an ardent fan of Japanese wrestling, I'd like to make some points ignored. First, the New Japan vs. UWFI feud came at a time when Keiji Muto was having excellent title matches, and just finished winning a very good G1 Climax tournament. The concept of the feud didn't make any sense since all the matches were worked strong style while under the New Japan banner. Why would New Japan wrestlers work a style that they don't use regularly? I can't ignore the amount of money made by the feud, but it ruined the heavyweight division in New Japan. Currently Muto has no role in the company and hasn't had one excellent match since the feud started. His greatest strength is being able to wrestle a junior heavyweight style while being a heavyweight. That's all been neutralized. New Japan admitted having no worthy contenders for Shinya Hashimoto by having that embarrassing tournament for a title shot with the likes of Hiroyoshi Tenzan, Osamu Nishimura, Satoshi Kojima, and Mishiyoshi Ohara, which took up valuable television time during the Super Junior Tournament. The tag team division isn't much better with them pushing the Golden Cups as a top team. The only good tag team matches are with the Junior Horsemen. I had to criticize All Japan because I love the fact there are always clean finishes in the middle of the ring, but their handling of Dan Crawford and Doug Furness is ridiculous. They haven't been on television more than two or three times in the past year, and are basically a jobber tag team. They should be in the mix with the top teams. Can someone explain why Yoshinari Ogawa got to win the junior heavyweight title? Did anyone see the match Crawford had with Rob Van Dam last year and all the average title matches Ogawa has had since winning the title? Craig Collins and Sonia Connecticut Ray Stevens Thanks for the nice article on Ray Stevens. It was quite a poignant statement when you said that his passing was like the closing chapter of a time that ended long ago that millions grew up watching. Like yourself, I watched Stevens while growing up in this area. The first Cow Palace house show I ever saw was in February 1970 with Pat Patterson vs. Peter Maivia and Ray Stevens vs. Fred Blassie as the main events. I went with my dad and brother and later saw the legendary Patterson vs. Stevens death match in July of that year. I saw Stevens in 1971 lost to U.S. title to Paul DeMarco. In the mid-70s, while visiting relatives in Chicago, I saw matches and interviews with Stevens and Nick Bockwinkel along with the likes of Billy Robinson, Vern Gagne, Crusher, and Bruiser. Also, thanks for mentioning Ray's last appearance in March on the Newark Public Access Channel. I was able to get a tape of the show, which sadly, was his last television appearance. Without The Observer, I wouldn't have ever known about it. Marshall Fish San Mateo, California This is the end of this conversion. Be sure to comment and subscribe. See you next time.